Again, thank you so much for your time. This is the Cloud Center of Excellence we're going to talk about today. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the organizational structure for Cloud Center of Excellence, and Elizabeth will be able to take us through some of the personality traits and some of the uh, capabilities necessary to make sure that you're effectively uh, capitalizing on your Cloud Center of Excellence. So we'll cover the CCOE. We'll talk about automation. We'll talk about some of the principles, how to choose the right teams for your Cloud Center of Excellence. As you start to think about cloud migrations, incorporating a Cloud Center of Excellence program in your platform is going to be very critical, and especially something that should be done early on. So this is not the scenario where you start migrating to the cloud and then decide, eh, you know what, we should get one of those centers of excellence happening. This is one of the things that you want to do right out of the gate because it's going to help set the strategy and the framework for your organization. So we'll talk through some of the challenges and some of the best practices that we've seen as well, too. So I found this uh, definition from the Cloud Management Report 2017. I really think it encapsulates uh, what it is to be the Cloud Center of Excellence, especially that first part there, the cross-functional team. As you start to move to a cloud strategy, you want to make sure that you stay away from concerns around siloing an organization. So a lot of what we see with groups going to cloud is that you'll have one packet move into cloud in this structure, one packet moving over here, one over there that's not paying much mind to security, and then somebody in another corner that might be using a different cloud platform altogether. So that cross-functional team within your organization is going to help set the standards and help set the framework for moving forward in cloud. So what does the Cloud Center of Excellence provide to you? First key point, structure and operations. As you form your team, you start finding those folks that can help join that organizational structure. It's going to help you with operational efficiencies. As you have your team from different components, you're able to interact with each other, able to understand where some limitations are, where some opportunities are. So the structure, the operations of your Cloud Center of Excellence are going to be very important. Evaluation is another big one as well, too. Things that sometimes people don't think about, that the pace of innovation, something like AWS, is incredible every day. It's either a new service that is coming out or an enhancement to a service that already exists. Cloud Center of Excellence team is going to take folks from across the spectrum that are going to be able to keep up with some of that pace and spread that message within the organization. So staying ahead of the technology curve is going to build confidence within your organization. Governance, rules, responsibilities. Talk back to that silo piece having the CCOE in place, able to set the groundwork for an organization as they move to cloud. You want to keep that policy in place, understand where the security requirements are, and spread that across the organization. So having good cloud governance is going to be an outcome as we talk about some of the personalities that are involved in the Cloud Center of Excellence. And innovation. You need to be able to innovate quickly when you've got cloud technologies, because there is the new things happening all the time, or more security, more layers in place. So having folks that understand and can focus on their specific domains is going to allow you the ability to innovate in a faster fashion. When you see all of the things coming out in cloud today, and your organization sees what is capable, what is available, they want to be able to move at that pace. So Cloud Center of Excel is going to help enable some of that innovation. The automation really, really is key. So we're going to talk a lot today about consistency, about repeatability. Automation is a big piece. Cloud Center of Excellence and having everybody focused on that piece is going to allow for modernized infrastructure, modern and efficient pipelines, easy to communicate, easy to understand, because again, you're going with an organizational focus here. CICD, continuous integration, continuous deployment cornerstone of CCOE. You're setting foundations for repeatability across your organization. You're going to be able to enable that CI CD pipeline by having a strong cloud center of excellence and doing more with less. If you've got the repeatable processes in place, if you have the foundation components in place, if you have the templatized deployments in place, you're going to be able to do those things with less effort. Your CCOE, your organization can focus on other responsibilities in moving to the cloud. So doing more with less, critical. So who benefits? We talk about a CCOE. 
leadership benefits, right? Your CIOs, your CTOs, project managers, your security professionals. Security, critical focus. They've got to be a part of this, right? So your security professionals, because again, you're incorporating them in the process, you're setting templates, and you're moving forward quickly. The IT teams, the framework, repeatable processes. Your organizations now are going to understand this is how we do it. This is the template that I can deploy to get where I need to go. So that is going to be much easier to communicate, and you're going to be able to keep that component structured for your organization, especially when you start talking about disruptive technologies. One of the things you want to stay away from is groups will just kind of go off on their own. So setting those templates in place, making sure your organization understands where you're going is going to be critical to your success and your customers. So that's those end users. The end users are going to benefit because you've got templatized architectures and you can move forward with that quickly. So when they have questions or they see something new coming up or they want to be able to get a project started quickly, they can find that templatized process and be able to move forward with it. Build the right team. We're going to hear a little bit more about the team here in a little bit. The team is really, really critical component. It's going to be across different disciplines within your organization, whether that's security or app development. All of those people should have a seat at the table because it's going to help you as an organization. Scope and grow the team's responsibilities. When you have an organization that is thinking about moving to the cloud, then they start moving to the cloud, the team and what that team is doing, that's going to change. Got to be able to maintain that ability to change. The scope of what they're doing is going to change based on new capabilities or new technologies. So make sure as you start to develop a cloud center of excellence, you're able to have that team change in what they're doing and meld across the transition. And empower them to teach and follow best practices. There's a tremendous amount out there about best practice in cloud. AWS has some fantastic tools as you start to move to a cloud based organization, empower your team to be advocates for cloud, to understand what you're doing as an organization, and be able to communicate that down to the end users, or to the project managers, or to the security department. You want to make sure that these are becoming your advocates as you start to move to a cloud-based organization. The other component to that, the cost. AWS allows incredible things. You can deploy at will. You're going to pay for that. So you need to make sure that as you're deploying, you're being conscious about your cost. Your CCOE, your organization, should understand the implications of different deployment methodologies. So again, we talk about the repeatability and about templates. Again, this is going to help you control not only your organization from a security and deployment perspective, but also from a cost perspective as well, too. That's part of those best practices. Got a very busy picture up here around CCOE across the organization. What we want to depict with this picture is really talking about the fact that there are components at different layers within, whether it's your tier one, your call center, or up to your engineering. You've got a DevOps practice. You've got security that's going across different layers from the, the top line uh, architecture and SME level all the way down to your operations making sure that you're adhering to compliance standards and compliance frameworks that you have within an organization or within your industry as well. So the CCOE is going to be living toward that top component there, the leadership and management teams, but it flows throughout the organization. So you need to understand as you start to build out this team, as Elizabeth will talk about here in a few minutes, how all of those different components fit in at various levels. And your CCOE should be able to have insight, and if you have the right team in place, and you've got the different groups represented, you're going to be across that organization, top to bottom. So why do I need a cloud center of excellence? Enable accelerated, sustainable adoption of cloud across the enterprise. That's the key. As we've worked with groups throughout our almost nine years at JHC Technology from both the commercial and government sector, it's the types of things that we see and where the challenges lie. Organizations will start to move to a cloud solution because certain people within the organization think that's the right thing to do. But if it's not picked up, if it's not across the enterprise, 
you start then to kind of have struggles, right? Because this group's doing it, but this group doesn't really understand it. Your cloud center of excellence is going to help to make sure that everybody's on board with that and be able to help that organization adopt and accelerate into the cloud. It's a transformation about people. The technology, very, very big, but it's about people. As you start to move toward cloud, you have to get folks on board. They've got to understand and they've got to be able to evangelize what they're doing. So it's not just about the technology, it's really about the people, which is what we're looking at here today. Cloud adoption framework, that's the place to get started with it and that's where I'll tag in Elizabeth. Thank you, Matt. So as Matt said, AWS thinks very much about frameworks and how to do this. And when I talk about frameworks, I think of it like prescriptions. I come from the world of healthcare, and people like prescriptions in, if I take two pills, I'll be healthy by Friday and have a great weekend. I think of framework and prescriptions more around diet and exercise. We know they make a big difference. It's sometimes a difficult change to make, but in the end, it's usually successful. So as we look through the cloud adoption framework, we put them into six different categories, which AWS calls perspectives. And now we color code them specifically. So I'll start on the right, because these are the technical perspectives. We have platform, this is your infrastructure. This is the things that you think about the data center in the cloud. It's the true infrastructure side of the house, what you're putting in. Next you have security. Security needs to be day zero, not even day one. We have to start from the beginning with security. There's lots of conversations around the DevOps structure. I want DevSecOps. I want security to be best friends right from the beginning. So we need to make sure we put security in everything that we do. Then we have operations. Operations is different in the cloud. It's not just we moved it somewhere else, but how we manage it, who does what, how much automation we put in, this changes how we think about operations. And it's not just the technical team doing operations in the back. It goes all the way down to our help desk. We have to change when that call comes in. The help desk needs to know who now supports that and put it through the right tiers appropriately. So we're really talking about the full spectrum of an IT organization. And then we move to the other side of the house. It has a lot to do more with the people in the business. And this is where I focus in my practice. The business is changing because now IT is enabling the business. We're not doing things for the blinky lights, fun new service sake. We're doing IT to enable our business, to move our business forward and in response to our business. We're creating a partnership between IT and business. Over 50% of IT spend is happening outside of IT in most organizations. Is your marketing team spending their IT money elsewhere? If IT starts to become stronger and the cloud helps enable this, you're bringing that spend back into your organization. Next, we think about people. As Matt said, this is a people transformation as much as a technology one. And the really important thing to think about for success is can you answer the question, what does this all mean for me, for everyone in your organization? Because that's where we see success. When we create that unknown of what is this change gonna do to my job, am I still part of this? That breeds things that we don't want. So we wanna address it right up front with communication that people are part of this and we wanna bring them in. And finally, governance. Well, this is on the business side. We do have to do governance on how we're gonna bring business units and applications on board. It's starting to tie the technical and the business together in terms of governance. So a lot of times we think about this in more traditional project management, but it's more than that. How do we create that flywheel mechanisms so that we have feedback, we know what we're gonna do next, and we know how to do it securely? So who are we gonna put on this team? Personalities matter, sometimes even more than the technical aspect. So when I think about traits of who I wanna work on the center of excellence, I want somebody who likes to experiment. A lot of us were ingrained with a fear of failure. We need to change that culture when we move to the cloud because now we can iterate, monitor, measure, and try new things fast and cost effectively. We're not buying a server, racking it up before we figure out that something's not gonna work. We can do something in a couple of days and spin it down. So we need somebody who wants to be that part of that experimentation and trying things that are new. But they need to be results oriented. It's not just trying for trying's sake. We need to prove we're doing something. What are we doing? 
So driving results, driving the organization forward, which requires you to have some boldness. And when we think about these types of people, you need to have that ability to stand up and be confident in what you're asking for. And that's not easy for a lot of people in technical roles. That's not where they come from. That's not the role they've served in the past. So we want to help cultivate that. Ability to influence. This isn't I'm at the top and I'm in a command and control situation. This is influence by work, influence by conversation. How do you help cultivate an organization where it's OK for somebody in the lower level to propose something? Maybe a software developer has an amazing idea. They need to be able to be comfortable to bring it up. Because in the end, this is all about the customer. Your customer may be your end user outside the organization, or it might just be a business unit or mission within your organization. Identify your customer. And don't think it's just one type of person. It's all across the board. And we want to make sure we focus on them with laser precision. We're doing this on their behalf. Because when we talk about change, change is hard. I like to say, when you talk to a room, who thinks we need change? Most of the people in the room will raise their hand, right? Who wants to be part of that change? A few less people may raise their hand. And you say, who wants to lead the change? And everybody runs for the doors. It's not easy. So we want the people who aren't running for the doors to be part of this. So as we think about these change agents, which I think is a great term for it, because it's agnostic of where you are and where you're coming from. You want to be a change agent. You want to think about how we're going to implement this absolute fundamental shift of how we work in our organizations. We're going to evolve. This is never going to be a set it and forget it. This is constant change. And how do we know if change is working? We need to measure it, we need to monitor it, and we need to iterate on what we've learned. So being comfortable with change isn't easy for everyone, but we got to get there. And finally, we want really diverse and cross-functional ideas. I like to say my rule of thumb is if you eat lunch with somebody every day, you need to find a new friend to work on this with. We need to branch out. We need to find new people. Cookies help, depending on your organization. So does alcohol. <laughs> but you want to go out and find new people to meet with, because now we're working together. We're not in the silos of, well, I'm a dev, I'm infrastructure, I'm operation. We need to come together as a team for this all to work. And finally, we need to think big. This is hard sometimes. We're used to having restraints. Well, we can't do that because. Anybody have that conversations in your organizations? Anybody else come from the division of IT of no, not now, call me later? I've been there. We need to come back to let's figure this out together. Yeah, we can do that. Let's figure out the details and we'll make it work. So think big. Start thinking about what you would do if you had all the time, money, and resources in the world. Make that big picture and then start tackling it. It's OK to think big along the way. And you'll see in the chart, we start thinking about business application services. You notice it doesn't say IT. We think about the business. We're focused on the business and our organization. And then we split into two sides, an engineering, more technical side, and a cloud business office, which might be a new term for you. When we think about the engineering side, infrastructure, operations, security, that feels comfortable to most people from IT. Business cloud, uh, the cloud business office, they're like, oh, that's the PMO's job. But it's not. It's everybody's job. Because part of that is not only our governance and architecture, getting people trained up, determining engagement, financing, but evangelism. You know, Matt used that word. Our job is to evangelize, inspire, and make people want to be part of this. This is exciting. This might be completely new to something in your organization, especially in some legacy organization. This can be drastic change. And it's exciting. Use the excitement and drive it forward. Because the CCOE is going to capture that and help move it. So let's get in the details. Let's get tactical. Who's on this? So we're going to start in the middle of my green, senior leadership. We like to do single-threaded leaders at the top. I want one who's going to run the business side, usually has a practice management background. Some people call this a product manager, a chief business 
office leader. We have lots of titles, but really when it comes down to it, at the beginning, they're my Swiss Army knife. They know who to call if we need HR's help. They know who to call for communications. They need to, who to call when we need to send stuff out. They're going to be that point person for the business side. Their partner in crime is the enterprise architect who is responsible for what gets decided. Because unlike other steering committee and organizations, people on the CCOE are doers. You get your hands dirty and you work. This isn't pontificating, this is work. So as an architect, I want you to actually be doing it with the people, not just pontificating on ideas. So who are you working with? When we think about blue, infrastructure. What server stacks are you going to use? What kind of guardrails are we going to start putting into all of this? What infrastructure decisions are we going to make to support what our organization needs to do? And then, who do we work with? We work with security, because as I said, security is day zero. Be best friends. CISOs are good people, even if they're used to saying no. We can bring them around. I'm a former HIPAA privacy and security officer in healthcare. I'm the epitome of no, that's not safe. But I was the first organization to go to the cloud with clinical care. We ran a laboratory, no servers on site, successfully. I'm thankful to say I can do it, work in the cloud, and not go to jail. I pass all my audits. You can too. And then we start to think about operations. Who's building the runbooks? Who's got a CMDB that may not be up to date? The cloud allows for a transparency you've never had before. You know where everything is. You can tag, you can report, you can know who's doing what in a way you couldn't even fathom before. And again, operations is all the way through down to your help desk, all the way up. People need to know what's going on and how to handle it. And we want to come in and help you build those run books and playbooks so that it is repeatable. And ultimately, as much as we can, automate it. So this starts to sound scary. You're going to automate my job away. Or maybe I'm a DBA. You're going to go to a managed database? What does that mean for me? There's 10 of us. What are you going to do? We have to start thinking about managing these questions when we start putting this together. And we'll get to how cloud roles start to evolve. And then up at the top, my people that are gray are applications. And why don't they get a nice solid color? This is the most rotated group in the CCOE. So if we start thinking about maybe the first round of apps, we move our .NETs, and then we'll move a set of Java. As applications onboard, they're going to come to the CCOE. We're going to set an onboarding. And this isn't onboarding as a new hires. This is onboarding as, this is as an application owner, what you should expect from us and what we will expect from you. So we'll rotate them through. And finally, the friends we tend to forget about, HR and communications. They need to be our best friends. Because in HR, we're going to start doing training, getting people up to speed. We're going to ramp them up fast and get moving. But as we have new hires, we may have new job descriptions. And we work in organizations where it's not always so easy to flip a switch and write a new job description. We may have unions. We may have government contracts. We may have contractors on site with our federal employees. So it's not a matter of, oh, I wrote a new job description. HR, please implement that. No, we recognize that's not the case. So we need to work with them to figure out what is the right methodology to get this moving. And then communicate, communicate, communicate. You need to tell people what you're doing and why you're doing it. We're not changing for change's sake. We're changing for the better. And that communication is really important. And we want to get it out there. So having somebody who can help with that communication will be critical. So we started with a small group, maybe six to 10 people max. But now as our organization grows and we start thinking about more all in, we get bigger, the CCO is going to scale. I've seen it scale up to a five to 10% of an IT organization, depending on how large the organization is. But the key thing here is the types of people are still going to be there, but there's never siloed teams. So if I look down at infrastructure, there's a lot of blue infrastructure people, but there's still security and operations on that team. Security still has infrastructure and ops, et cetera. We still need to keep that cross-functional growth within these segmented teams. And while the cloud business office may have started with that one individual, that product manager, and support from HR and communications, now we get a bigger support agency to start thinking about enterprise architecture, 
which is both from a technical perspective and a business perspective of working together. Onboarding, which I discussed, is how you bring the applications into the cloud. Marketing, continue to evangelize. Everybody who's on a CCOE is a marketing person in of themselves. They need to go out and speak the wonders of what this is doing to your organization. I like to call it internal peer pressure. If one part of the organization has moved to cloud and is being really successful, sometimes the higher ups go, well, you're not doing that. Why aren't you? You want to be on the good side of that conversation. Governance. Governance fits both technical and business. And finally, finance. Matt talked briefly about cost. We want to know what we're spending. We want to be very careful on what we're spending. One of the things that organizations will onboard a business unit, and they'll say, I need everything always on full bore. No, none of this auto scaling, none of this turning things down. I need it on. And you can say, OK, but can we address this in three months? Because they may think their developers are working all night long. Well, just in case somebody wants to log in, I have to have it ready. Let them do that. But run the cost analysis and come back two to three months later and say, OK, we, we did the analysis and we see that nobody logged in between 7 PM and 6 AM any day in the last three months. Can we turn it off for you and save you 20%? That's a nice way to go to the business. No longer are you sending them bills, but you're helping them save any. And this doesn't matter if you're a chargeback or IT absorbs the cost. You can look at it as a showback. I'm not necessarily charging you, but I'm showing you what the bill looks like and how I can do it better so that we have more money to try that innovation and to try these new things. And that is a completely different conversation than we've been having outside of the cloud and historically. So I said, where are these people coming from? Because that's one of the top questions. It's great you say an infrastructure person, but what do these roles come from? So if we think about architecture, we typically source them from an enterprise architect, ops architect, and even security. Those are pretty standard. We make cloud versions of them, train them up. When we start thinking about infrastructure, you'll notice in the cloud world, we just call it a cloud infrastructure engineer because while you may have been a compute or a storage or networking, I want you to learn the stack in the cloud because it's so integrated in the cloud, you can't sit in your silo anymore. So day one, that's not gonna happen. We have to recognize this is something we're working towards. This isn't a light switch that we just turn on and everything's there. We need to train people up for this. We need to recognize this is change and how are we going to deal with it. Same thing when we start talking about operations, especially when you move to CICD pipelines. The idea of being a release engineer is completely different. I come from an organization where I could do continuous integration, but I couldn't do continuous delivery based on the way my audits worked and the way that we had to be transparent. That's fine. Automate what you can. Work within what you have to do. That's completely acceptable. Then capacity planning. I find that asset tracking teams, asset management, CMDBs, capacity planning, this completely changes in the cloud. What's available to you is completely different and how you plan for it is completely different. So we need to train people for that. Security, everybody needs to be a security engineer at some level and understand it. One of the things I built into teams previously was the idea of what things cost. So I ran software development teams for the last 15 years. And when we moved to the cloud, I had emails that came to me for every $500 my team spent in the early days. And I was also the scrum master. So I'd show up to scrum in the morning and say, okay, who left something on or how many more tests did we do? Somebody explain the bill. So it was ingrained in the whole team what things cost. Right now, my developers wouldn't have necessarily thought about what a server costs, they just used it. But now we built into the cost of the, the culture what cost was, what they were spending, and what it meant to the business. And also, we were for profit, we did laboratory testing. I could now build the IT costs into my cost of goods. So no longer was I just the cost center, we were part of the reimbursement process as well. So then we start thinking about business. As I said, that product owner, that chief lead there on the business side has to have some level of pro uh, project management in their background. So they could have been a relationship or portfolio manager. Some business analysts do really well in this role. And then project management. Anybody still doing project and waterfall methodologies? Maybe. I'm a, P, a recovering PMP, I understand. 
But if we start thinking about Agile and Scrum, both from a methodology and from a tool stack, you know, there's plenty of tools out there like Ajira and a Confluence and many more, but we're changing how we're tracking things, how often, how we're talking to each other, all of these things change. I've never seen anybody do Agile or Scrum by the book. Everybody's gonna have a flavor it. So don't feel pressured that if you're not following it to the T, it's, it's okay. But start implementing that, because that's where you get that measuring, monitoring, and transparency. No longer is it a six month project, and at the end of six months, whatever you produce no longer matches what the organization needs. Been part of those. We're moving faster together. And then data. Data is our new currency. We're producing more data than anybody historically. We're capturing data, be it IoT, be it devices, be it video streams, et cetera. We need to do something with it to make it usable. So we want to train up data engineers. Because once we move from those data silos to either a data warehouse or a data lake, depending on your organization, we've now enabled our ability to do business analytics and then even move to the next great place of MLAI. Because if we don't have the data, the MLAI services are hard to use. We need to have data to drive them. So we want to think about those as we put our data groups together. And finally, the applications. As we're onboarding these applications, we hope that those teams come to us with some level of solutions architects or business analysts and possibly even software engineers. So all of this is going to rotate through. And also the rule is these don't have to be your titles. These are just examples. So use what works in your organization. So let's talk about some of the best practices that CCOEs use. First is using that cloud adoption framework. It's out there, I think we're just over 20 pages. It's a worthwhile to read. It's not something that's gonna put you to bed at the end of the night. But think about how they apply to your organization and what you wanna do with it. And then, as we said earlier, enthusiasm has to be a criteria for getting on the CCOE. We want you to inspire and evangelize some organizations use the word evangelist as a title, because that's kind of cool. That's a lot different than anything I've ever been called before on an on-prem world. So think about, we can train your skills, but enthusiasm we can't train. We need to come to the table with it. That passion will help shift anything you're doing right now. And start small. As I said, we don't set it, forget it. We don't change the world overnight. Start small. Try it out, show that value you're gonna to bring to the business. Build that internal peer pressure that people wanna be part of this. I wanna do that too, because that will help swell and grow up. And then rotate people. Take all these wonderful people you train, put them back out in the org, bring new people in, train them up, and keep that rotation. Because in the end, you don't have to hire that rock star, they probably work for you. Cultivate them and send them back out in the organization and build the next rock star. It's much more cost effective and it works great for your culture. When we start documenting, we still have things like charters, roles and responsibilities, but these are gonna help us to promote what we're doing and document what we're doing. And finally, as I said, five to seven people it tends to be no more than 10 when you start, but it can grow up to 10% of your IT organization as a whole. And remember, they're doers not just leaders who delegate. So what have we learned along the way? From technical, we talked about this earlier, reference architectures, what's repeatable? How can we set a landing zone or a space for that .NET, that Java, that COTS to come on so that when we need more, it's instantaneous, it's very quick, there's very little variability, we're ready for it. And then when something new comes on, we build a new reference architecture but it just helps that speed of repeatability. Engage and evangelize. Do you think you've heard evangelize enough yet? It's central. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Why are we doing this? What does this mean for you? And how does this better the organization and the business as a whole? And finally, scale. Start small, build it up. Learn the tools and the services. We had over 1,400 releases at AWS last year, and there's just gonna be more this year. You can start with minimal viable products and grow from there. It's a great way to work. But keep an eye on what service stack is coming and what new services are gonna help you and your organization complete your mission. Because these tools can be leveraged, 
but the people who learn them can additionally be leveraged to make this happen. So what's the hard part? People's the hard part, but what challenges do we see? One is not thinking about DR and failover. Sometimes that's how people dip their toe into AWS. It's just starting with disaster recovery and backups. That's completely acceptable. But think about that, plan for it. We want to plan for our infrastructure provisioning. Don't always go big, go fast. You can start small and grow up the sizes you're doing. Make sure you plan accordingly. Because you can always scale up, you can put auto scaling in, don't overspend. And finally, train your people. Make the organization aware of what you're doing. Because that training is going to be what accelerates your path. AWS offers over 150 now available trainings online for you for free. Use them. We continue to add more as new services come. Keep an eye on them. Have somebody's job be to check in what new trainings are available, what new service stacks, so that we can use those as needed. Asset management. As I said, CMDBs tend not to get tracking for everything. In the cloud with tagging and transparency, we know exactly what you have. So use that capability to keep track of it. Because in the end, that's how we optimize our cost. We know what's out there. We know who's using it, why they're using it. And that is going to move us forward. Keep track and optimize your costs. And finally, change management. As we said, change is hard. Plan for it. Communicate it. Over communicate it. But have consistency in your communication. What I tell my executives and what I might tell my software developer in terms of communication can be different, but they're going to be consistent in message. So make sure you're consistent in message. We want everybody to know what we're doing and why. And finally, let's finish with some best practices. Collaborate. Find your friends. Go eat at a different lunch table. You need to collaborate with the business, with HR, communications, whoever. Keep reaching out for new collaborations. Because the more you can bring it in, centralize it, from a security perspective, you're much safer. You understand. You're no longer having the servers under the desk or outsourcing somewhere else, or even where somebody who's swiping a credit card and setting up their own accounts that you have no awareness of. We want to change that idea. But in order to change it, we need to act differently. We need to put the olive branch out there. We need to work with people. We need to be open to hearing opinions and diverse opinions. This is different, but it's OK. And finally, define your KPIs. Traditionally, we think of KPIs, save money, move faster. But things to think about in terms of KPIs, releases. How fast am I doing a release? When am I doing my release? I come from an organization where we used to have an air mattress in the IT office for handling things overnight. Anybody else have one of those? Where the interviewee would come and we'd quick hide it. We don't want them to know that's how we operate here. Don't be that organization. I moved to a Saturday night deployment to Wednesday at noon. And it works because it's a new way of thinking. It's a new way of functioning. And now my KPI is satisfaction of my staff. They're not working nights. They're not working weekends. They get to spend their time doing what they want versus being in the office or staying up all night. So your KPIs are not just your hard technical, but your people and satisfaction. And gain visibility. Put those tabletops out in the lunchroom. Put up posters. Let people know what you're doing and why. Get the visibility of the project out there. Make up a fun marketing acronym. It doesn't have to be a cloud center of excellence. It could be a cloud acceleration office. Do what works for your organization. Find that friend in marketing to make a cool new term for you. And finally, empower your team. They want to do things. You probably have people who are doing things outside of work you don't even know they have a skill set for. Do some assessments. Find out what people are interested in and empower them to try something new with a new service, a new role, a new support function. It'll increase their satisfaction and increase their ability to want to stay with you. And in organizations and public sector where we might not have the highest salary, having satisfaction is really important to keep those staff with you and be a place where people want to work. 
So with that, do you want to open it up? We'll do some Q&A. If anybody has any questions, raise your hand. We'll have a roaming mic. And we'll start over here. Right behind you is a mic. Uh, hi there. Just a quick question. Uh, historically, our enterprise architects have reference architectures that are technologically and tool agnostic, and our solution architects are constrained by our capital investments, so on-prem. As we go into the cloud, how do you see that changing? You've got the ability, as you move to the cloud, to have all sorts of agnostic tools, right? So that could be third-party tools, it can be tools within AWS that are going to allow you portability. Um, you are opened up on both sides to so many different options within the cloud, and that, and that landscape's even changing every single day. So um, I think you know, part of the, the CCOE and part of the groups and the opportunity to kind of explore that and innovate and, and build on that, it's gonna, it's gonna be transformational. And sometimes people bring their tools. Right? You don't have to have all new tools in the cloud. Some tools are portable. Sometimes I see people retire a tool and then use it off the marketplace. It's the same tool, they just adopt it in a different manner. Um, so you can absolutely think about what tooling you want to use and going forward, how to integrate them. Just like security, it's an and conversation. Everything you do now, and more. So all the tools you know, and more tool capabilities. Other questions? Everybody, oh, we got one in the front. Good morning. Um, for an organization that's just uh, starting up the cloud migration journey, would you say the, cr the cloud center or center of excellence is step one? Um, and part B of the question is, can you touch on training? Because that's, that's key. Uh, very, uh, comes up daily. Um, because uh, everybody says, well, I'm not trained to do this. So uh, kind of finding the balance between trying to be nimble and go there faster and getting the processes and governance in place. Can, I, can you share some thoughts on uh, what's the best approach to, to getting there? So you're going to want to establish your CCOE as early on in the process as you can. So it depends also on the organization, right? If you're moving to the cloud and moving to a cloud migration, where is that coming from? Is it coming from a group of developers that have a new application, they want to get it on there? Is it coming from the top, right, from the organization pushing it on down? If you get some of that uh, executive support and say we want to drive this forward, that's going to carry a lot of weight. The CCOE being able to, to go across groups within an organization is going to enable a lot of that communication early on so that the whole group knows where we're going. We know why the organization is going there. If you don't have some of that messaging at an enterprise level, an organizational level, then you start to, again, you start to run into these silos, right? Because this development group, ah, we know security, we'll, we'll deal with it, we'll be plenty secure. Se security, on the meantime, has no idea that this is going on, right? And they wanna have things to say about it. So enabling a CCOE across your organization from the moment you're planning cloud through the deployment of cloud is critical because that communication, that understanding then is going to be across the organization. And that's gonna allow everybody to kind of keep in step with how we wanna move forward as a group. The training. Uh, so I'm gonna add one critical. more thing. Yeah. I think of the CCOE, if you're building a house, it's the foundation, it's the solid. You can decide where that second floor bathroom's going on later with your MLAI service, but if you don't have a solid foundation, the house is gonna fall down. So that's where it absolutely is a day one activity to get going. Now, if I'm Filling that with a staff of people who have no cloud experience. How do I think about that? So I think of training plans actually in two functions. First are ramp up plans. How do I get my team that I put on the CCOE immediately understanding the cloud? And so at AWS, we help support with really defined plans to help people based on the type of role they're serving come up to speed with knowledge. And then we create training plans for the future people who may be joining or future application teams. So I think of them in two phases. How do I get the immediate people up and running with the right knowledge to make the right decisions? And then how do I ever board or onboard future people? Don't allow that training to just be a one-time thing, right? All of the time. And this is, is, goes to the, the personalities that you were talking about earlier. You want folks that are going to subscribe to the AWS blog and read about the new cool things every day, whether it's a new region, different part of the world, or whether that's a, a new endpoint for CloudFront, and how can that relate to the constituents that I'm trying to serve. So, so the training, 
and knowledge, it, folks have to have to really be want to be a part of that, and drive that. In the middle. Uh, yes, um, you mentioned as part of the COE, you'd have a dedicated resource keeping track of uh, new innovations, new services that uh, AWS would present. Um, do you guys have a roadmap for those type of services, or are you more react reactionary to either market trends, industry trends, or what your competitors might be doing in that space? So 90% of the roadmap from AWS comes from customer requests. So we want to hear from you. We want to know what you're doing and what you need us to do on your behalf. So 90% of the roadmap is going to come that way. As a former customer, I will tell you that I would get on soapboxes, I need stuff, and I would see it happen. Then we're going to innovate on the customer's behalf. So we're going to start forward thinking for you and put stuff out there maybe you haven't thought of. And in that case, we're doing that last 10%. In terms of road mapping, we will talk under NDA about where we are and what we're doing. But mostly we want to talk about what you need so that we can road map according to what the customers need. That's more important to us. Also in the middle. Hi, I'm just wondering about the timing, specifically you know, for the public sector, everybody's waiting for the protected B, right? And how do we move there? So, you know, creating a center of excellence, a lot of people are waiting for that protected B portion. So I'm asking you hints on the protected B, as well as should you put uh, center of Excellence before that comes about, when you know that's going to be the main pl platform? Um, I always say you start with the because they're going to be reactive, regardless if the government puts a new regulation in any time. You know, we think about EU putting GPDR in. Just because you were moving to the cloud, you didn't stop because of GPDR coming along. We kept moving and we iterated and changed to match it. Um, you know, healthcare in the U.S. is HIPAA, PEPIDA here. Whatever that regulation is going to be, we're going to continue to evolve to support that, both from an AWS supporting compliance regimes through how you react at your organization to support that type of organization. They'll change. Your question is about what services are available for protected So the question, uh, the statement was there's questions on services and protected. Um, I will defer to some of the our security analysts, I don't have the details on that one, unfortunately, right. off the top of my head, but we're happy to put you in touch with somebody to answer that more fully. It's, it's always a challenge, right, is figuring out what's going to be available. But I don't think that that prevents you from understanding what the cloud provides now and understanding what the different service types are, whether they're the specific individuals and, and understanding where you would use S3 and EBS and, and how you want to protect a VPC as a whole anyway, and, and dealing with uh, network access or how it's gonna work within your organization. Start getting that understanding of cloud and understanding the people that understand the security of the different cloud components. And you can start that way when all these options come available, you can, you're already ahead of the game, right? You can start doing that mapping and everything. But I, I, I wouldn't wait, right? I definitely wanna get the understanding out there first from the team, even just overall cloud concepts. Hi. Um, with respect to uh, being a part of CCOE, um, it, people would have to get trained up and um, possibly getting certified. And um, the closest certification uh, test center, PSI, is in Montreal. And um, it's two hours away from here. So uh, is there any plans to have any of those uh, test centers in Ottawa? I don't have an answer for that. Off the top of my head. Um, I don't sit in the training in CERT org, unfortunately. But we are constantly adding new places to do it. I invite everybody to reInvent, which is happening in a couple of weeks. We will be doing certification tests there throughout the week. Um, so that's available as an option as well if you're not necessarily looking. Some organizations go up to certification. Some organizations will include certification in their staffing. It's up to an organization where they push that boundary. But if it's not available locally, and I completely respect the travel, there are other options where we hold summits, and especially at reInvent, where we will have certification potential as well. And I don't think it limits you, right? There are so many tools out there to understand and to learn about cloud, right? If you're in a situation where uh, it's too difficult to actually find folks that have signed off and they've gotten the certification, I like that. It's got a lot going on over there. Um, <laughs> 
online tools, right? Being able to at least come in and talk about cloud and talk about AWS intelligently, that's gonna send a huge message beyond whether you are or not, are not certified. So we'll wrap up. Our, our contact information is available to here. Please feel free to reach out to either one of us or our organizations. We have lots of support for you up in Canada now, which is exciting. And enjoy your day. Thank um, you.